Dusty Bush. Chapter Twenty Five: The Last Battle. Lady Arabella had instructed her solicitors to hurry on with the conveyance of Diana's Grove, so no time was lost in letting Adam Salton have formal possession of the estate. After his interview with Sir Nathaniel, he had taken steps to begin putting his plan into action. In order to accumulate the necessary amount of fine sea sand, he ordered the steward to prepare for an elaborate system of top dressing all the grounds. A great heap of the sand, brought from bays of the Welsh coast, began to grow at the back of the grove. No one seemed to suspect that it was there for any purpose other than what had been given out. Lady Arabella, who alone could have guessed, was now so absorbed in her matrimonial pursuit of Edgar Caswell that she had neither time nor inclination for thought extraneous to this. She had not yet moved from the house. Though she had formally handed over the estate, Adam put up a rough corrugated iron shed behind the grove, in which he stored his explosives, all being ready for his great attempt. Whenever the time should come, he was now content to wait, and in order to pass the time, interested himself in other things, even in Caswell's great kite, which still flew from the high tower of Castra Regis. The mound of fine sand grew to proportions so vast as to puzzle the bailiffs and farmers round the brow. The hour of the intended cataclysm was approaching apace. Adam wished, but in vain, for an opportunity which would appear to be natural of visiting Caswell in the turret of Castra Regis. At last, one morning, he met Lady Arabella moving towards the castle, so he took his courage a deux mains. And asked to be allowed to accompany her. She was glad, for her own purposes, to comply with his wishes. So together they entered and found their way to the turret room. Caswell was much surprised to see Adam come to his house, but lent himself to the task of seeming to be pleased. He played the host so well as to deceive even Adam. They all went out on the turret roof, where he explained to his guests. The mechanism for raising and lowering the kite, taking also the opportunity of testing the movements of the multitudes of birds, how they answered almost instantaneously to the lowering or raising of the kite. As Lady Arabella walked home with Adam from Castra Regis, she asked him if she might make a request. Permission having been accorded, she explained that before she finally left Diana's Grove, where she had lived so long. She had a desire to know the depth of the well hole. Adam was really happy to meet her wishes, not for many sentiment, but because he wished to give some valid and ostensible reason for examining the passage of the worm, which would obviate any suspicion resulting from his being on the premises. He brought from London a Kelvin sounding apparatus with a sufficient length of piano wire for testing any probable depth. The wire passed easily over the running wheel, and when this was once fixed over the hole, he was satisfied to wait till the most advantageous time for his final experiment. In the meantime, affairs had been going quietly at Mercy Farm. Lilla, of course, felt lonely in the absence of her cousin, but the even tenor of life went on for her as for others. After the first shock of parting was over. Things went back to their accustomed routine. In one respect, however, there was a marked difference. So long as home conditions had remained unchanged, Lilla was content to put ambition far from her and to settle down to the life which had been hers as long as she could remember. But Mimi's marriage set her thinking. Naturally, she came to the conclusion that she too might have a mate. There was not for her much choice. There was little movement in the matrimonial direction at the farmhouse. She did not approve of the personality of Edgar Caswell, and his struggle with Mimi had frightened her. But he was unmistakably an excellent parti, much better than she could have any right to expect. This weighs much with a woman, and more particularly one of her class. So on the whole, she was content to let things take their course, 
and to abide by the issue. As time went on, she had reason to believe that things did not point to happiness. She could not shut her eyes to certain disturbing facts, amongst which were the existence of Lady Arabella and her growing intimacy with Edgar Caswell. As well as his own cold and haughty nature, so little in accord with the ardor which is the foundation of a young maid's dreams of happiness. How things would, of necessity, alter if she were to marry, she was afraid to think. All told, the prospect was not happy for her, and she had a secret longing that something might occur to upset the order of things, as at present arranged. When Lilla received a note from Edgar Caswell asking if he might come to tea on the following afternoon, her heart sank within her. If it was only for her father's sake, she must not refuse him or show any disinclination which he might construe into inclivity. She missed Mimi more than she could say or even dared to think. Hitherto she had always looked to her cousin for sympathy, for understanding, for loyal support. Now she and all these things and a thousand others, gentle, reassuring, supporting, were gone. And instead there was a horrible aching void. For the whole afternoon and evening, and for the following forenoon, poor Lilla's loneliness grew to be a positive agony. For the first time she began to realize the sense of her loss, as though all the previous suffering had been merely a preparation. Everything she looked at, everything she remembered or thought of, became laden with poignant memory. And then on the top of all was a new sense of dread, the reaction from the sense of security, which had surrounded her all her life, to a never-quieted apprehension, was at times almost more than she could bear. It so filled her with fear that she had a haunting feeling that she would as soon die as live. However, whatever might be her own feelings, duty had to be done, and as she had been brought up to consider duty first, she braced herself to go through, to the very best of her ability, what was before her. Still, the severe and prolonged struggle for self-control told upon Lilla. She looked, as she felt, ill and weak. She was really in a nerveless and prostrate condition. With black circles round her eyes, pale even to her lips, and with an instinctive trembling, which she was quite unable to repress, it was for her a sad mischance that Mimi was away, for her love would have seen through all obscuring causes, and have brought to light the girl's unhappy condition of health. Lilla was utterly unable to do anything to escape from the ordeal before her, but her cousin, with the experience of her former struggles with Mr. Caswell, and of the condition in which these left her, would have taken steps, even peremptory ones if necessary, to prevent a repetition. Edgar arrived punctually to the time appointed by himself. When Lilla through the great window saw him approaching the house, her condition of nervous upset was pitiable. She braced herself up, however, and managed to get through the interview in its preliminary stages without any perceptible change in her normal appearance and bearing. It had been to her an added terror that the black shadow of Ulanga, whom she dreaded, would follow hard on his master. A load was lifted from her mind when he did not make his usual stealthy approach. She had also feared, though in lesser degree, lest Lady Arabella should be present to make trouble for her as before. With a woman's natural forethought in a difficult position, she had provided the furnishing of the tea-table as a subtle indication of the social difference between her and her guest. She had chosen the implements of service, as well as all the provender set forth, of the humblest kind. Instead of arranging the silver teapot and china cups, she had set out an earthen teapot, such as was in common use in the farm kitchen. The same idea was carried out in the cups and saucers of thick homely delft, and in the cream jug of similar kind. The bread was of simple whole meal home-baked, the butter was good, since she had made it herself, while the preserves and honey came from her own garden. 
Her face beamed with satisfaction when the guest eyed the appointments with a supercilious glance. It was a shock to the poor girl herself, for she enjoyed offering to a guest the little hospitalities possible to her, but that had to be sacrificed with other pleasures. Caswell's face was more set and ironclad than ever. His piercing eyes seemed from the very beginning to look her through and through. Her heart quailed when she thought of what would follow, of what would be the end, when this was only the beginning. As some protection, though it could be only of a sentimental kind, she brought from her own room the photographs of Mimi, of her grandfather, and of Adam Salton, whom by now she had grown to look on with reliance, as a brother whom she could trust. She kept the pictures near her heart, to which her hand naturally strayed, when her feelings of constraint, distrust, or fear became so poignant as to interfere with the calm which she felt was necessary to help her through the ordeal. At first Edgar Coswell was courteous and polite, even thoughtful, but after a little while, when he found her resistance to his domination grow, he abandoned all forms of self-control, and appeared in the same dominance as he had previously shown. She was prepared, however, for this, both by her former experience and the natural fighting instinct within her. By this means, as the minutes went on, both developed the power and preserved the equality in which they had begun. Without warning, the psychic battle between the two individualities began afresh. This time both the positive and negative causes were all in favor of the man. The woman was alone and in bad spirits, unsupported. Nothing at all was in her favor except the memory of the two victorious contests. Whereas the man, though unaided as before by either Lady Arabella or Ulanga, was in full strength, well rested, and in flourishing circumstances. It was not, therefore, to be wondered at that his native dominance of character had full opportunity of asserting itself. He began his preliminary stare with a conscious sense of power, and, as it appeared to have immediate effect on the girl, he felt an ever-growing conviction of ultimate victory. After a little, Lilla's resolution began to flag. She felt that the contest was unequal, that she was unable to put forth her best efforts. As she was an unselfish person, she could not fight so well in her own battle as in that of someone whom she loved and to whom she was devoted. Edgar saw the relaxing of the muscles of face and brow, and the almost collapse of the heavy eyelids which seemed tumbling downward in sleep. Lilla made gallant efforts to brace her dwindling powers, but for a time unsuccessfully. At length there came an interruption, which seemed like a powerful stimulant. Through the wide window she saw Lady Arabella enter the plain gateway of the farm, and advance towards the hall door. She was clad as usual in tight-fitting white, which accentuated her thin, sinuous figure. The sight did for Lilla what no voluntary effort could have done. Her eyes flashed, and in an instant she felt as though a new life had suddenly developed within her. Lady Arabella's entry, in her usual unconcerned, haughty, supercilious way, heightened the effect, so that when the two stood close to each other, battle was joined. Mr. Caswell, too, took new courage from her coming, and all his masterfulness and power came back to him. His looks, intensified, had more obvious effect than had been noticeable that day. Lilla seemed at last overcome by his dominance. Her face became red and pale, violently red and ghastly pale, by rapid turns. Her strength seemed gone, her knees collapsed, and she was actually sinking on the floor when to her surprise and joy Mimi came into the room, running hurriedly and breathing heavily. Lilla rushed to her in the two clasped hands. With that a new sense of power, greater than Lilla had ever seen in her, seemed to quicken her cousin. Her hand swept the air in front of Edgar Caswell, seeming to drive him backward more and more by each movement, till at last 
he seemed to be actually hurled through the door which Mimi's entrance had left open, and fell at full length on the gravel path without. Then came the final and complete collapse of Lilla, who, without a sound, sank down on the floor. End of chapter 25 This recording is in the public domain.